gangland widow Judy Moran is tonight contemplating spending the rest of her life in prison after a jury found her guilty of orchestrating the murder of her brother-in-law. Judy Moran was all smiles as usual as she returned to prison to await sentencing. Moran lost two sons and two husbands to murder but apparently hadn't learned any lessons from those deaths. Guns, money and narcotics. The Moran family spoke in the language of violence. They were one of the most notable cartel families in Australia. When the widowed Judy Moran married into this family, she had no clue of the power and opulence she was gaining. Judy had always played the helpless victim and showed off her life. Even after losing half her family within a short period in the early 2000s, she could never get rid of her greed for money and fame. She made some questionable choices by flashing her dirty laundry for everyone to see, which pushed her close ones away from her. In an unfortunate turn of events, Judy brought upon her own downfall by plotting the murder of a family member. The whole plan was poorly executed, and Judy Moran was caught red-handed. So how did she rise to power? Why did she plot the murder? Stay tuned as we bring you the shocking details of the case of Judy and Desmond Tuppence Moran. In this story of Judith Marianne Moran, we get to know about a showgirl who became a deadly boss and destroyed her life with her very own hands. Judy Moran was born in Victoria on December 18, 1944. Her father worked at a harbor and later as a florist in the Victoria Market. Her mother was a Tivoli dancer. Judy had a brother who was a farmer. In the early 1980s, he distanced himself from the family and never contacted them again. Judy never had much of a formal education, but she had a sharp and bright mind. As a child, she learned to dance. She was 12 when her mother got pneumonia. She had to quit school to work and support her family. She began working as a sewing machine operator and later assisted in a fashion office. She met Leslie when she was 18. Leslie John Johnny Cole was a day laborer and was connected to narcotics trading. They had a son, Mark Cole, who later changed his name to Mark Moran during his youth. At this point, Judy began to make more progress in her career. She had become a sales assistant in the fashion store in an upscale hotel in Melbourne. She used to steal clothes from her workplace, which was an indication that Judy always had a criminal mindset. She was also a regular showgirl in notable Australian TV shows like Graham Kennedy's in Melbourne Tonight. After staying in the marriage for two years, Judy divorced Cole. He was a heavy drinker, which was believed to be the reason for the split. However, he didn't live long. He was gunned down in the gangland conflict in 1982. But Judy hadn't learned her lessons in dating. She continued to explore men from the world of narcotics trading and met Louis Moran. He opened up the world of narcotics trading and violence for her. Soon she gained power, became one of the greediest women in the world, and gathered a number of enemies. Louis Moran and his elder brother, Des Tuppence Moran, were sons of a controversial nurse named Belle Moran. Their father left Belle when they were young, and she had to raise them alone. They belonged to the working class and had seen their fair share of struggles, which turned them into hardened criminals in the later years. It was love at first sight for both Louis and Judy. They began dating and in 1965 moved in together. They had a son named Jason Moran after two years. Despite being half-brothers, Mark and Jason had a strong connection and they became prominent figures in the world of Australian narcotics trade. They were sworn enemies to the rival Williams family, which eventually led to the climax of the gangland wars. It took the lives of half of the Moran clan. The Moran brothers, Mark and Jason, fired at Carl Williams in 1999 based on a rift in their narcotics trade. Unfortunately, Williams survived the attack and decided to take revenge on the brothers. Mark Moran was gunned down in 2000 in front of his house in Aberfeldy, Victoria. It's speculated that the orders to take his life had come directly from Carl. Judy was coping with the loss of her elder son when Jason Moran was gunned down in 2003. He went to Cross Keys Reservation in Essendon 
and was fired at in the parking lot when he walked back to his vehicle. He had gone there to watch his children play football. His father was in prison at the time. The next incident truly shook Judy Moran's world. In 2004, the Williams family took the life of her husband, Louis Moran. Louis was out on bail and wasn't carrying a firearm. He was at the Brunswick Club Hotel in Sydney. Two men wearing balaclavas approached him, chased him down, and fired at him twice. The bullets hit him in the back of his head, and he succumbed to his injuries. Lewis's accomplice, Herbert Bertie Rout, was also under attack. He was severely injured, but survived. I turned around, and there was this gunman. He said something to me. I said, go and get f***ed, you weak c***. He popped me. I stayed conscious for a while. All will be dealt with, my darling, Judy reportedly muttered as she said her final goodbyes to her husband at his funeral. While no one really knew what she'd meant, the words soon became very popular. Judy was deeply disturbed by the media portrayal of her husband, so two weeks after his demise, she signed with a celebrity agent and announced that she would write an autobiography to clear her husband's name. However, many people saw this as a mere publicity stunt. Judy Moran has always been a flamboyant character. At one stage, she signed with celebrity agent Harry M. Miller, hoping to capitalize on the notoriety that came with the title Gangland Matriarch. People get the wrong impression of me. I'm a mother and a housewife, and that's all I have ever been. Victims of crime gangs caused an uproar to prevent the book from being published. However, Victorian law only prohibited a convict to write or publish any book, and Judy Moran wasn't a registered offender. She received a handsome advance of $110,000 for her manuscript. Judy's old friend, Sandra Cummings, later mentioned that her family also wasn't happy with her decision, but she didn't pay heed to anyone. Judy always wanted to be in the spotlight, and although I told her the book would cause trouble and push the girls, Mark and Jason's wives, and the grandkids away, Judy didn't listen. Judy's book was titled My Story and was published by Random House in 2005. However, readers and reviewers were upset because she didn't write too many revelations about her family's criminal history. Unfortunately, due to the inclusion of falsified information, the publisher had to call back and destroy 20,000 copies of the book. The incident raised many eyebrows, and people speculated whether she could ever be trusted. However, after correcting the information, Random House published the book again in the same year. Judy had already gained popularity in the media due to her high-profile life. She always had a way with words. Her speech could sway people easily, and this is probably why she was good at portraying a fake persona and hiding all her crimes behind it. In her book, she described herself as a helpless woman in a patriarchal society without the shelter of her husband. She wrote, I have lived in a world of murder, corruption, bribery, crime, and fear. A world where, to ask too many questions, would see you bested for your curiosity. A world with rules for men, and where women know their place. I am a wife with no husband. I am a mother with no children. Judy also appeared in an interview in 2008 and described her unimaginable loss. Forever the charmer, she told everyone how much she despised the gangland war, and she mentioned that the concept of an eye for an eye had led to too many unnecessary deaths. A lot of sadness, I'm sure. And I mean, I've lost three members of my family and very close friends, but there's been so many other boys that have been murdered as well, and I feel for their families too. I feel sorry for any mother that's been involved with anything that's happened to anyone during this gangland war. She mentioned that, despite the rivalry, her sons hadn't taken the life of anyone, but had become the victims of the brutal war. My children didn't kill anyone, but they've paid the ultimate price with their life. She was brought face to face with Carl Williams' mother, Barbara, and the interview soon became uncomfortable as Judy confronted her and blamed the Williams for wiping out half the members of the Moran family. Barbara, you did say that um, that I, you can put your arms around your son and cuddle him, I can't. For a mother, from a mother, that's a terrible thing to say. That's like someone subhuman. You know, I mean, I could never say that about you. I've never said a word about you. 
I don't want to have this discussion. When asked if she enjoyed the limelight for being the matriarch, she agreed to it without hesitating. You enjoy the celebrity status of being oh. the matriarch of the Moran family. Well, I am the matriarch of my family. I'm the oldest member of my family and I'm proud of it. In 2007, Carl Williams was arrested and convicted of murder. Authorities had found evidence of his involvement in the deaths of Jason Moran and Louis Moran. Judy was present in the courtroom and didn't miss the chance to create drama and steal the spotlight. According to eyewitnesses, she stood up from her seat and gave Williams the stink eye. She stood and glared from the front row at Williams for four minutes before Purana Detective Senior Sergeant Stuart Bateson persuaded her to sit down. Don't fire them up, but this wasn't the end. Judy tried to apply her acting skills once again after committing the most dangerous crime of her existence, and it destroyed her whole life. Desmond and Louis Moran lived in the house their mother had left them. But after meeting Judy, Louis moved out. The brothers were supposedly involved in the narcotics business and earned hard cash together. In 1987, Des received a sentence of six years for the possession of amphetamines. His brother's involvement in his narcotics trade was covered by the mainstream media. It is alleged that Des Moran has been involved in drug trafficking with Louis Moran up until Louis Moran's murder in March 2004, a police document states. Even though Des and Judy didn't have a reason for enmity, Des despised her. He believed that she was a little too out there and created unnecessary drama. He hated that she always strived to prove herself better than others. A close associate of Des confirmed the same. I am aware that he disliked Judy Moran and had done so for at least 20 years. I had heard him say once or twice over the years that he believed Judy thought everyone owed her a living. According to Judy's old friend Sandra Cummings, Judy believed that Desmond was stealing millions of dollars from her, money that should have belonged to her late husband. With him gone, she considered herself as the rightful owner of the money. Judy believed that Lewis had millions put aside, and she believed that after Lewis was murdered, the access, knowledge, and money went to Tuppy. Mr. Brian Murphy, the detective whom Judy had hired to trace the remaining assets and money of her husband, confirmed the claims. She said that she'd been robbed by an accountant, and she reckoned that Lewis's money was now being held by the accountant and Des Moran. She said there were millions of dollars. She said that she believed that Tuppence was controlling the money, and that she was getting none, and that wasn't fair. In December 2006, Judy went to meet Des and demanded a new car and money from him, but Des refused to give her anything. You'll never get another cent off of me, he told her. Then, in March 2009, Des missed a bullet directed at him in his driveway. People suspected Judy, but the source of the attack was never identified. And despite an earlier attempt on his life, Des Moran refused to live in fear. But this incident had failed to scare him. I lost three people in the family. The next night I was out doing what I wanted to do. Of course, you're not going to let some hoon like this worry you. Unable to get Des to pay up, Judy decided to remove the problem altogether. She planned to take his life. In June 2009, she hired two gunmen, Jeff Armour and Michael Ferrogia, and their bullets hit their targets this time. Des was gunned down in his favorite hanging place, the Ascot Vale Cafe. He sustained injury in his head, neck, chest, and shoulder. Des Tuppence Moran was shot seven times at a deli in a busy shopping strip in 2009. Security footage captured Des's last moments before he was attacked. This is the last vision of her victim, Des Moran walking towards the Ascot Vale deli where he would be killed. Another security footage collected from a pharmacy shows a different angle of the moment the incident took place. Panicked onlookers took shelter to protect themselves as they watched the horror unfold before their eyes. Seconds later, gunman Jeffrey Armour and co-offender Michael Ferrugia walk calmly towards their target. The gunshots are heard by people in this pharmacy. Staff panic, closing the door. Ferrugia and Armour flee into the getaway car driven by Moran. Law enforcement officials raided Judy's house the same night. They found a safe that contained all the evidence of her being involved in Des Moran's death. They found everything needed for a professional hit. The killer's clothes, wigs, number plates, and this. Nine millimeter, um, 
HMK, um, black handgun, it needs to be loaded. Another uh, handgun, it's a, uh, needs to be a night aiming device on that. They also found a car in her garage. It matched the car captured in the security footage, and it was the vehicle that drove Armour and Farragia to and from the location. Judy Moran was calm when the investigating officer listed all the items they'd found in her home. She didn't react or show any signs of anxiety as the officer spoke to her. Just for your information, inside that safe we found uh, various items of clothing, jackets, gloves, um, two semi automatic pistols and ammunition, um, one revolver and ammunition, um, some ballot clubs and some rego plates. When the officer asked her if she knew anything about the items, she said that she didn't. There's a uh, safe in the wall. Do you know anything about that safe? She also had a shotgun hidden in her dog's bed. Judy was detained by the officers. As they brought her to the crime scene to replay the incidents, she began crying in front of the media and tried to blame the incident on the Williams family. They tried to kill Jason and I on this day in 2003. One of Carl Williams' gunmen was waiting for us on that day at the cemetery, but we went there the day before because Jason had a feeling. I wonder if they were there today. During her trial in February 2011, Judy denied all allegations brought against her. At first, she claimed that she'd been tending her son's grave the day Des was murdered, and she couldn't have been the one who drove Armour to the crime scene. But all the evidence pointed in her direction. It took the jury six days to deliberate and find her guilty of the charges. This time, Judy didn't hide her contempt for her brother-in-law. When she was asked about her relationship with Des, she accepted that she didn't like him at all. From the very first time I met Des, he was rude, crude, and no, I didn't like him, Judy told the jury. I didn't like his morals. I didn't like what he did to his mother, especially, let alone biting his brother's ear off. She also confessed that her relationship with Lewis had ended in 1995, but they continued to stay together, and Lewis took care of her financial needs. Lewis would give me $2,000 a month for incidentals, and he would pay all the utilities, rates, etc. He paid everything. If I needed clothing or anything, he would give me more. It just depended. One of the gunmen, Farragia, testified that after the incident, Judy was happy with the outcome and praised Armour. She also assured him that she would get rid of the evidence. She asked Jeff, did you get him? He said, yeah, no worries, I got him. She said, well done. She started patting him on his back. She said she'll look after everything. She'll get rid of everything. Judy sounded outraged when the prosecution asked her about the shotgun hidden in the dog's bed. That horrified me because my little dog used to pull that cushion around all the time, Judy protested in court. He was only eight months old, and when the police said the gun was loaded, I felt sick. That's disgusting. Han Karkeet, a witness from the day of the incident, also testified before the jury. At first I heard the shots in the car, and um, the shooter I heard the shooting like four shots um, in succession with a pause in between the third and the fourth shot. Probably about 15 minutes later, Judy Moran turned up. And then I knew, obviously, yes, yeah, because she was screaming, oh, Dizzy, 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 Dizzy. Judy received a sentence of 26 years without parole. Her gunman received the same prison time. But before the curtains closed at the trial for the last time, Judy Moran applied the last bit of her acting skills to sway everyone in the courtroom. You are wrong, sir, she called out. I am innocent. As of 2023, she is serving her time in the Dame Phyllis Frost Center in West Melbourne. Louis Moran's accomplice, Herbert Rout, had never been a fan of hers and sounded relieved after her sentence. Good riddance, certainly. Uh, scheming, conniving, rotten witch of a woman. Former Australian Police Commissioner Christine Nixon had a similar statement about her. A, a colourful character, I have to say, and someone who I understand till the very last minute was, was proclaiming her innocence. And, you know, she was found guilty and now she's been sentenced and, and it is, uh, I think, an episode over in the history of this state. Although Judy's arrest might have seemed like a closure to the gangland wars, crime expert Andrew Fraser said it might not be the end to all crimes. Someone might always come to replace the former villains. It's not the end of wars over drugs, it's not the end of turf wars, because the minute somebody like the Morans are gone or Carl Williams is gone, there are people ready to step into the breach. But what about the matriarchy created by the former showgirl? 
who would carry on the torch now that she's behind bars. Reportedly, her descendants refused to carry the family name as it became a source of trouble for them. According to a report in 2019, the wives and children of Mark and Jason Moran changed their last names and began keeping a low profile to protect themselves from the shadows of the Moran family's heinous crimes. Do you think Judy Moran rushed into a rivalry with her brother-in-law? Do you believe that she could have avoided the clash? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching the video. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.